you have your Bible with you this morning, turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, and we arrive at verses 9 through 11. Um, the, uh, just a uh, sort of a piggyback on what uh, Michael said and related to the um, even the Christmas program tonight for, for little uh, kids. Um, Don, a couple of weeks ago, made mention of the fact that, you know, you try to take uh, uh, improvement in, in some step in sort of your uh, anti-COVID uh, act activity. And it is, uh, if you've been paying attention at all to the news or just to the experience of your your friends and acquaintances, uh, then you know uh, that that right now uh, this this thing is spreading everywhere, all the time. And so, especially when you're around the older members of our congregation and so forth, uh, just try to keep that in mind and uh, and, and and make a note uh, to yourself. Um, you know that you be careful because. If, you, if you've gone to the store, you've probably been within six feet of somebody who has this right now because it's, it's just everywhere. It's just spreading that, that, uh, that quickly. And so keep that, uh, just keep that in mind. Um, just before we read our text for this morning, I want to remind you of the sort of the, uh, what the scholars would call the inclusio that exists for the whole book of First. John, that is in 1 John 1, 3, and then again at the end of the book in 1 John 5, 13, John states his purpose for writing, and you have to keep that purpose in mind, otherwise, rather than John being this really, having this very extremely hopeful, positive purpose, you'll start to experience him as somebody who runs around and throws wet blankets on everything, uh, which is what he'll seem to be doing in our text for this morning. So just, just remember, everything that he's writing, he has this as his purpose. That which we have seen and have heard, we are presently announcing also to you, and here's the purpose clause, in order that, for this reason, for this purpose, that you also may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So that ultimately, you might have a saving personal relationship with God himself. That you will have that is the purpose of everything that I'm writing. And he says the same thing again at the end. 1 John 5, 13, these things I have written to you in order that you may know that you have life eternal to all those who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you'll know you have fellowship with God, so that you'll know that you have eternal life. That's why John um, seems to be throwing this wet blanket around from time to time. It ultimately has this extremely positive purpose. So with that said, let's stand together and we'll read verses 9 through 11. 1 John 2 9 through 11. Whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness still. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, 
we can say with the psalmist, O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Uh, Father, we are reminded day by day when we pay attention to the sky, when we pay attention to our surroundings, when we pay attention in any serious way to the whole created order that surrounds us, that we are a part of, that everything about it declares that your name is majestic, that these things, these systems, these remarkable bodies, the remarkable sky, the remarkable consistency of the pattern of sun and moon and stars, all of this is your created order. How majestic is your name in all the earth. And when we look at your heavens and the work of your fingers and all of these things, and we reflect upon the vast majesty of the universe, we are led to the psalmist question, what are we that you should be mindful of us? What are we that you should care about us? And yet you assure us that you do. That you know of us right down to the numbers of the hairs on our head. What seems random to us is never random to you. Ultimately, viruses do not spread randomly. You are never surprised when somebody gets sick. You are never surprised when somebody stays well. You are never surprised by those who live through things, and you're never surprised by those who die. For you are the one who works all things after the counsel of your will. But you have made the kinds of beings that bear your image, the kinds of people who we are, who have been gathered together this morning singing praises to you, looking at your word, reflecting upon our lives in the light of song lyrics and scriptural quotations and teaching. You've reminded us that you are the one who has made us who we are, a little lower than the heavenly beings. You have placed us over the entire created order, as is evident right now to anyone who pays attention. We oversee all of the other creatures, monitor them, look to them, transcend them in that we bear your image. And so, Father, on the one hand, we rejoice uh, so much along with Greg and Lorray as a little girl made in your image has entered their family officially. And we pray for uh, Livia as she grows in these early days that you would watch over her and keep her. And we just pray your blessing upon their entire family as they enjoy this grand occasion. And yet at the other end, we think of those families who have recently lost Parents and wives, husbands, and continue and will continue to feel the weight of such losses 
May you lift them up and carry them through. We thank you for those who have gotten sick and become well. We pray for those who are struggling with illness right now, that you would mercifully touch them with your healing hand and carry them through. And we pray for our nation as we have a sort of an ongoing political sense of upheaval and division. Uh, may you heal our land and heal our conversation and make our leaders wise in their duties and in their responsibilities. For they, as we, are in your hands. We ask for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. Now, throughout 1 John, uh, as we've been pointing out, um, you, uh, you'll notice that, um, like in all the New Testament, you understand what you're seeing and what you're reading in the New Testament much better if you are very familiar with what's in the Old Testament. You, know, you could take that as almost a, a small advertisement for Terry's class in the prophet Joel. Right? Um, especially in something like John, in the chapter that we're in right now, as John starts to talk about light and darkness, well, he's doing something that the Psalms do all but continually, and that the Old Testament does very, very broadly, but especially in the Psalms, uh, what's called uh, the categories of the Hebrew wisdom genre, Hebrew poetry. Uh, the Psalms open with sort of the classic example of exactly what John is doing here in 1 John chapter 2, right? Remember how Psalm 1 opens. I just restarted the Psalms in my daily reading, so I, I, I read this on, uh, on Friday. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season. Its leaf doesn't wither. In all that he does, he prospers. The wicked are not so, but are like chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. Do you see that? Two, two kinds of people. One kind is named twice, but there's just two kinds of people there. There's the blessed, and there's the wicked. The blessed are also called the righteous, and over on the other side, there's the wicked. That's the nature of reality, according to the Bible. Now, we, we, we don't like that kind of talk. It's... Uh, you know, we, we who are more sophisticated, especially in, in the last 50 years or so in our postmodern times, that we love multiple shades of gray, and we believe that that's where most people live. They're neither among the blessed or among the wicked. They're neither walking in light or walking in darkness. They're sort of in this, this middle zone where everything is murky and gray and hazy and, most importantly, impossible to clearly distinguish. And John is simply announcing to us, reality is actually not like that. 
There are two kinds of human beings in the world and only two kinds. The blessed and the wicked. And, and you and I are in one or the other of those categories of human being. John's categories in our text, we're either walking in the light or wandering lost in darkness. So only two options. We're either, as he'll say later on in this book, people of the Christ or people of the Antichrist. You are one or the other. You are either or. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in that law he meditates day and night. Now there's one person who absolutely, perfectly, completely reflected the person of Psalm 1. That was the Lord Jesus Christ. And so John gave us this exhortation. So how do you, how, how do you try to be, uh, how, what, what does it actually look like uh, to be this Psalm 1 person? Well, remember how he put it to us. Well, walk in the same manner as Jesus walked. Jesus is the ultimate, the perfect example of this Psalm 1 person. And so within the categories of Hebrew wisdom. Think about your life. Whoever says that he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness. Whoever loves his brother abides in the light, and in him there is no cause for stumbling. But whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And in this text, John is acting out the role of a spiritual physician. And you're trying to diagnose yourself. Am I in the light or I am in the darkness? And John has some clear diagnostics that you're supposed to work with to figure out whether you are a person of light or whether you are a person of darkness. And it's very closely related in John's mind to our attitude toward fellow believers. Now, he's, he uses the terminology of brothers, um, but in the context of 1 John, brothers uh, certainly includes both genders, right? So it's believers, either male or female. He's using brother's language, but absolutely everything that he says applies equally between women or between men and women within the church. It's one believing person's attitude and relationship with another believing person. That's what he has in mind. I'd state our thesis for this morning this way. We must beware of the blinding force of hatred toward brothers, believers. We must beware of the blinding force of hatred toward brothers, toward believers. Number one, Beware of fooling yourself with a false profession of faith. Verse 9, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is in the darkness until now. Whoever says... We, we, have a, we have a great example of, of how this works and how jarring uh, what John is doing here really is. Uh, and we just, uh, we just 
did it together this morning, right? So we opened this service by singing, I saw the light. I saw the light. So there you are. I saw the light. And then John says, did you? Are you sure? I'm not sure that you should be so sure that you've seen the light. Whoever says, I saw the light, and hates his brother, hasn't seen the light. But he's in darkness. Now Jesus comes along and says an even more disturbing thing. Um, Actually, John is simply repeating these categories of Jesus because he's Jesus' disciple. So John had heard Jesus vindicate the kind of thing that John is doing in something like the Sermon on the Mount. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, not everyone who says, I saw the light, will enter the kingdom of heaven. But the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. On that day, many will say, Lord, Lord. Many will say, Jesus is Lord. Many will say, I saw the light. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me. You workers of lawlessness. Now, this is an analysis of people, you see, who have, they've, they've all said the right things. Um, it's, a, it, it's a wonderful thing for a Christian to be able to say, I've saw, I saw the light. And praise the Lord for opening your eyes that you would see. That's a wonderful, wonderful thing. You ought to do that. We ought to sing songs like we sang this morning. We ought to sing that way. Um, It's a wonderful thing when Christians profess, Jesus is Lord. That's a wonderful thing. We should talk that way. We should profess that way. We should declare ourselves in that way. Jesus is Lord. That's a, that's a wonderful thing. But Jesus warned us. Not everyone who says wonderful things, and not even everyone who says them just right. Like you can't improve on Jesus is Lord. It's a necessary thing to say. John, later in this letter, is going to insist on it. He's going to absolutely insist on it. He's going to warn you if you can't say that, if you don't believe that, just like here, you're still in darkness. So it's, it's no criticism of saying Jesus is Lord. It's no criticism of singing I saw the light. It's a warning. It's a warning. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. And so our text, whoever says that he is in the light but hates his brother, John says, let me tell you something, he's not in the light. He's walking in the darkness. Uh, Now, remember how Jesus put it. I declare to them, I never knew you. What's wrong with them? You workers of lawlessness. Now, this again, this is really important that you do this in your head, theologically, consistently, This is a really, really important connection that you're supposed to learn when you're going through 1 John, that love and obedience and your relationship to Jesus and obedience 
and, and love and commandments and your relationship to Jesus and commandments, that those things are really tightly related because love and commandments are unbreakably related together. Remember what Jesus can say, and we've looked at it now. This is the third week in a row, Matthew 22, 39. The second big summary statement for the great commandment is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Smaller category, easier, easier category. You shall love your brother as yourself. On these commandments depend all the law and the prophets. In other words, every single law in the Old Testament is summarized in that statement. The first half of the Ten Commandments is largely summarized by the first piece of that statement. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The second half of the commandments is summarized by you shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. Um, so look at that attitude towards your neighbor and, and, and watch yourself. Because if you say, I saw the light, but hate a bunch of people. You're, all the evidence is you're walking in darkness. It's just a general warning. Somebody who grew up in church all my life, you hear, you, this, is a common, this is a common thing people say everywhere. I love Jesus, but I don't care much for the church. We say that glibly. I love Jesus, I just don't care much for the church, which is a way of saying, I don't care much for the brothers. The brothers are a disappointing bunch. Now, I'm, when it comes to Jesus, like I'm full of love. I'm like a fountain of love. Um, but, you know, when it comes to the people that I'm supposed to sing with, uh, they are a disappointing bunch. Um, they're not... I mean, they're not like me. I mean, they're not, they're not like that. You know, I'm, I'm so gloriously sanctified, I really can't get together with the brothers because they're so disappointing. We talk that way. We think that way. And we think that way so foolishly that we're willing to talk that way and say something so obviously self-condemning right out loud because we just don't, see it. We don't experience it. We don't realize the implications of what we're saying. Whoever says that he's in the light, and remember, God is light. Christ is light. And hates his brother. He is in the darkness until now. It is a stern warning. Better learn to love these imperfect people that we worship with. If the Lord demands it. You can't have a solid assurance of salvation without it. According to Jesus, according to John, whose words I think you should take pretty heavily and weigh pretty heavily. Secondly, be sure that you are among those remaining in the light. Um, verse 10, uh, John opens, uh, each of these verses open with a present participle. Um, the one saying to be in the light, the one continuously making this profession. Now uh, here in verse 10, the one loving his brother, the one loving his brother, remains in the light and there is not stumbling in him. So, so a present participle followed by a present indicative verb. The one loving his brother in an ongoing way 
is remaining in the light. And by loving his brother, there's really not much about his life that's likely to spiritually trip him up. That's what he means by the stumbling block. There's no stumbling block in him. Well, so, well, he's not sinlessly perfect. No, of course he's not sinlessly perfect, but remember, here's the kind of thing that John has in mind. The one loving his brother. Here's the second half of the Ten Commandments, as recorded in uh, Exodus 20. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, the first one seems pretty obvious. Love your neighbor, don't kill him. Don't kill him, right? Well, but Jesus, remember how Jesus fleshed that that out a bit in uh, in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5. You have heard that it was said, verse 21, by those of old, you shall not murder, and all murderers are liable to judgment. But I say unto you, now when Jesus says, but I say unto you, he's not saying, I've got a completely different idea. No, no, no. What he means is, but I say unto you, but I want to help you understand some of the implications of that. Everyone who is angry with his brother, whoever insults his brother, whoever says you fool, is liable to the hell of fire. So see, the the, the loving, to love your brother is to refrain from anger against them. Deal with your anger against them. It is not to revile them. It is not to call them names. Be uncontrollably frustrated with them. You you have to have this lawful relationship with them. The mention of adultery, that stands in for all, every aspect of of sexual life. And in the, in the, sex according to the Bible is completely confined to the covenant of marriage. It's a tremendous, tremendously narrow field where righteous sexuality can take uh, place. And therefore, loving your neighbor um, sexually means not just that you don't, you know, commit adultery against your husband or wife, but that you're not in sexual relationship to somebody who's neither your husband or wife. Uh, and, and on and on you could go uh, along that category. In other words, love for your neighbors limits your sexuality right into the course of divine revelation, and the law itself. Third one's a little more obvious, right? Loving your neighbor means you're not going to steal from them. Uh, You're going to honor their property. You're not going to take their uh, stuff. And more than that, according to Paul, it implies something even positive. Remember how Paul put it in Ephesians 4. Uh, Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his hands, that he may have something to share with anybody in need. It's not just you don't just rob your neighbor, but you're also open to helping them um, when they need it, but it has a definite relationship to how you think about their their property. Um, The loving person doesn't bear false witness. Now, what tempts us to bear false witness is it helps us to tear other people down to sort of build ourselves up. Oh, so-and-so's like this. You know, they don't glow in the dark like me. You know, they're, they're quite, oh, yes, many of the people in our church, they're like this. 
unlike me. I'm, not, I'm nothing like that, of course, but we both know that. Um, you know, that kind of talk. He said, don't talk. Loving people, loving people don't talk that way. Uh, and they don't, and finally, they, and they don't covet what other people have. Now, make no mistake about it. All of these unlawful things come to us as naturally as breath itself. They do. They do. And I, when I think about comforting, uh, coveting, I remembered uh, being in the first grade and my neighbor two blocks down, Randy Nelson, the two Randys in our class, Randy Nelson, invited me to go swimming with his family at the YMCA. Um, it's in the wintertime. And this is an indoor pool at the YMCA. And, and we went there, you know, in Rockford. We went, and the Y was relatively uh, new in the... Uh, in the 1960s there in, in Rockford. And I loved built-in swimming pools like nobody's business. It's the one thing I knew about heaven for sure. There's lots of built-in swimming pools there. Uh, I think everyone will have one in their backyard in heaven. Uh, that's, that's sort of how I thought about it. It's just that, that wonderful. And I thought it was really, really wonderful that pool and I'm, I'm walking home and thinking why don't we belong to the YMCA? What I mean Randy tell they go swimming at the YMCA like at least twice a week sometimes three times it's like they're almost already in heaven and I got my dumb life we never go anywhere swimming anywhere no YMCA, no built-in swimming pool. So I let my parents in on this as soon as I got home. You know, what's the matter with the way we run our household? No membership at the Y. What's that about? My father was not impressed. He said something about my food and my clothes and my room and, uh, and, a, and a long list of, of benefits that everybody's got. Um, um, but that's the point, right? A, a six-year-old automatically covets, just automatically. Show them something nicer than what they have, completely dissatisfied with the myriad things they have, and there we go. Love's not like that. Love's not like that. Uh, and so he's warning us. You need to be loving your brother. And the one who loves in that way, he's, he abides in the light. This is the born again person. This is the person, to go back to our song, this is the person who actually gives evidence that they've actually seen the light. They really have. They really have. What the, that, that verb for remaining is what in, in the Reformed creeds, um, and especially in the, in the real simple, uh, you know, Reformation understanding of doctrine called the, the tulip, right? So it's the P, and uh, call, standing for the perseverance of the saints. The saints remain. They remain. The one loving his brother is giving evidence that he's a saint. A persevering saint that's remaining. Whoever loves his brother and thus fulfills the law abides in the light, in God who is light. And there's no cause for stumbling in him. You know how many people walk away from the faith for love of money? It's common. You know how many people walk away from the faith for sake of a sexual partner that God says is illegitimate? It's common. Do you know how many people walk away from the faith because they want to hang on to hatred for somebody that God says they can't hate? It's common. Happens all the time. It stumbles them. It ruins them. It destroys them. But if you're submitting your life 
to the revealed will of God and loving your neighbor according to that revealed will, there's, there's nothing left to really trip you up. There's no stumbling block in them, he says. They're not likely to be ruined. Third and finally, beware of the blinding power of hatred. Now, we're, we're running out of time before we run out of uh, text, but verse 11, um, whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and doesn't know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. As part of this series, I've been rereading um, homilies by uh, Augustine, 1600 and some years. Uh, he, he preached a little series on 1 John around the year 406. Um, in the introduction to that little series of sermons, Augustine wrote this, this sentence. It was, when I read this, this was the sentence of the week and maybe it was the sentence of the month. Uh, I can come back to it. I'll go back to it for a long time. He wrote this, where there is charity, there is peace. And where there is humility, there is charity. Let me repeat that to you. Where there is charity, there is peace. And where there is humility, there is charity. Now, John would state it negatively this way. Where there is hatred, there is darkness. And where there is pride, there is hatred. Where there is hatred, there is darkness. And where there is pride, There is hatred. I'm sure Augustine's right about that. In other words, you, you see this yourself. Um, arrogant people are lousy at loving others. Humble people are good at it, by and large. If through coming to the gospel you've become genuinely humbled, it's likely that you can get along well with other people at church. You're not impressed with yourself. In fact, you're an expert on what's wrong with you. And so you have a lot less time to notice so much what's wrong with them, though there's plenty wrong with them. But you're not such an expert on what's wrong with them. By the grace of God, you've become an expert on what's wrong with you. Um, and where there's humility, there's the ability to love. But where there's arrogance, then we hate left and right. We're disappointed left and right. Whoever hates his brother. And again, it's that, it's, it's that present participle again. And everyone hating his brother is in the darkness. He's walking in the darkness. He doesn't know where he's going. In other words, he sings, because he sings, I saw the light. It was filled with hatred. He has no idea that the song is empty, but this text is defining. He's headed for absolute ruin. Doesn't know it. Has no idea where he's going. Because hatred blinds. Blinds. There's people who hate certain things that God has said. It blinds them. 
God says, I hate that. I hate that. Okay. I still love Jesus. Mm, John's, I wouldn't count on it. Wouldn't count on it. See, hatred walks away from the light. And it walks away from the light because it has this tremendously blinding force. So at the end of the day, John, see, John is trying to convict us in two directions. He said, "Check, are, are, do you love people according to the will and word of God? And watch out for hatred. You've got to get rid of that. If you if you want to be if you want to know that you're having fellowship with the Lord Jesus, you can, you've got to get rid of that. You get that out of your life. Whatever it takes, you've got to get rid of that. And he tells that to us so that we'll be among those who have fellowship with God. Fellowship with his son Jesus Christ. Fellowship with each other so that we can be among those who actually have good reason to believe. We've seen the light and remain in the light. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I ask that you'd enable us to see clearly, to leave hatred behind, to grow in love, to walk in the light, as you are in the light. Lord, give us the grounds of this great assurance that we have indeed seen the light and remain in it in Jesus' name. Amen.